And I, I think that's one thing that really came out of our, our paper was this this conclusion that feral is is largely defined as escape from human control and whether that's sort of our idea of um yeah for example what a, a dog is so a dog running loose in the UK would be termed feral because that's not how dogs are supposed to behave um and yeah we we have this idea of how animals should behave where they should be and when they kind of defy that that's that's when the feral label comes in and I think Welcome to the Anthrozoology Podcast. We're on episode 22. Today we're continuing our discussion of power words, which are terms that humans use to control the narratives of other than human lives. Today's term is feral, and it's a contentious term in our opinion. Our paper on this topic, uh, Uncivilized Behaviors, was published last year in Society and Animals Journal, and today we'll unpack that paper in a discussion with our special guest and co-author, Debbie Busby. Welcome, Debbie. So yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I'm really pleased to be kind of you know back in the the fold of of um, those of us who who wrote the paper. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm um, a lot further through my PhD now. So as well as being an equine behaviour consultant, um, helping owners resolve problem behaviours with their horses and um, supervising other consultants. I'm doing a PhD in qualitative methods, exploring um, the the idea of what is a good life for horses in the context of sustainability and um, particularly social license to operate, which is um, even since I started my PhD has become a lot higher up on the agenda of, of, of mainstream um, equestrian organizations such as the FEI. So I'm at the data collection stage of my PhD now after um, after the literature review and had my methodology and my ethics approved. So that's what I'm up to at the moment. Yeah, hi, hi, I'm Chris. Um, so my PhD looked at um, cat-human relations and discourses surrounding roaming cats. Um, and I'm I'm actually um, in the final stages now, hoping to submit next month. Yay! <laughs> um, but going back to Pharaoh, so sometimes I I share my PhD proposal to to people that want to get an idea of um, sort of what it entails to apply for a PhD, and I look at it and I cringe because it's feral, feral, and I want to go through with a red pen and like cross out feral, feral because we don't like that word anymore. <laughs> Um, and Farrell has sort of continued on since the paper and our original discussions to to play a, a, a part in, in my PhD. Uh, and I'm Michelle. I did my PhD on elephant-human relationships in Nepal and on uh, elephant and human health and welfare with the co-working relationship between Mahouts and uh, captive working elephants. Our uh, third co-host, Sarah, sends her apologies. She could not join us today, but she will see her again on our next episode. Back to you, Chris. <laughs> yeah, so, so should we start with a, um, a dictionary definition of feral? Um, so according to um, the Webster Dictionary, um, feral has three meanings. One, a relating to or suggestive of a wild beast. Two, not domesticated or cultivated, wild and free, having escaped from domestication and become wild. Um, and it's actually derived from the, the medi medieval Latin feralis, um, from the Latin fera, meaning wild animal. But what does feral mean? Well, I think it's interesting because in those definitions, they actually seem to equate feral to wild, which is not how we use it in in conversation, we usually equate feral with having escaped domestication, whereas we equate wild with never having been mm -hmm. domesticated. So it's interesting. I, I posed um, a question to, to various cat appreciation groups on Facebook, and the question was, what does feral mean to you? Um, and the data is written up as, as part of my PhD thesis. Um, and it's, it's it's super interesting. Most of them were one one word answers, and out of seven hundred and seventy responses, um, thirty five percent said wild, either wild by itself or wild 
um, paired with untamed, homeless, unsocialized, not domesticated. And again, domesticated, this that seemed to be defined either as meaning not house trained or um, as in domesticated, as in biologically domesticated. Um, so, yeah, to a lot of cat people, it means wild. But what does wild mean? And that seems to be more wild-like than actual wild. Um, so, yeah, all these different ideas about feral. Um, I was thinking when you um, read out those de definitions and something I've, I've thought about a lot as well is that as well as defining feral, we need to then, in conjunction with that, look at what our definitions of domesticated are and how they apply to how different species became became domesticated. So I think it would be interesting. Um, and as you said there, Chris, so you have two different types of understandings and meaning makings of domesticated amongst the people that you asked. I think it would be really interesting to drill down into the understandings of domestication and domesticated as it applies to you know a variety of species um so, you know such the ones that we touched on in the paper yeah one thing that um i actually didn't realize until till the yeah we started discussing the paper was horses are they domesticated um well yeah really good question and i i mean i um it's interesting. I refer to the horses that I work with that are owned in, if you want to, uh, owned or, or, you know, under the care of a guardian or a caregiver. Um, and I refer to them as captive managed because, and to me, domestication is a thin veneer in terms of horses. They weren't domesticated in the same way that, that cats or dogs were. And the first time that they interacted with humans was when they were hunted and killed for meat and it was after that that they that when um corralling and, and that type of farming became more prevalent that it was possible then to fence them in and then start to utilize their milk or even keep them in a holding situation before they were killed for meat, and it was it was later on that they were um, that they were they started to be used for um, as draft animals, pulling vehicles, and then being ridden. So their domestication did not involve at, at, at first. It didn't involve any kind of co-created relationship in the same way that dogs did for example hanging around the the campfires or the um on, on looking for food in rubbish heaps and that sort of thing um it was only later in the, the domestication process if you want to call it the domestication process that any type of relational activity became in became um involved in terms of humans such as um just by differences in temperament certain horses were seen to be more kind of tractable and or trainable um and then when the when enclosed breeding started then it was possible to form relationships with younger horses that then developed into those animals being able to be um, more easily trained. So it's, um, yeah, still a question that I like to ask and pose in terms of are horses domesticated? But in terms of captive managed, this term that I, I've started to use, captive managed, uh, in terms of what we're talking about, wild versus feral versus domesticated, not totally comfortable with um, the captive element of it, for sure they are managed. Um, if we turned the captive managed horses loose, how would they cope in whatever, um, and different? how would different breeds cope in, in whatever environment they were turned loose in? So a phrase that I saw recently in terms of um, uh, a UK, a recent um, 
bill that's been drafted in UK law is to call them a kept animal. So to term them as a kept animal, which I think is an interesting development in terms of how we look at our relationships, um, human animal relationships in general. So yeah, yeah. I, I think I think that's interesting thinking about cats too. So mm. um, there is some discussion about whether cats are fully domesticated or not, because many cats can and do thrive um, with no human intervention. Mm. But when we start to think about pedigree cats, and that's and and me and Sarah talk about this a lot, that they often experience more discomfort or they they really can't survive on the streets because they need regular grooming because they've been bred for sort of long long coats that need managing or the um the brachiophilus traits that make it hard for them to survive in in sort of dry that basically they need to be um yeah they're, they're more dependent on humans so it's almost like the the, the um pedigree or the these um sort of pedigree traits are being selected for to to make cats that really are completely domesticated and and I guess the same would be true with horses because if you Mm. you know a thoroughbred on Dartmoor may not survive as well as um yeah Dartmoor pony yeah um, Yeah, exactly yeah and yeah so that you know there came a point where almost like a kind of crossover point where selective breeding then started to have a clear effect in terms of the survivability of those of particular breeds in particular environments and of course initially the selective breeding was to meet the requirements of that environment but the way that breeds now have moved around the world means that there are um you know that thin-skinned breeds kept in cold damp climates such such as the uk um and even um you know what you were saying there about um, the the the, um, the condition of the cats, the the cats that live without an owner. I'm in Turkey at the moment, and I see that in the dogs that live as what you would call village dogs or street dogs or community dogs, and for sure they don't have an owner, but they are. Their health is improved or is sometimes or often improved or maintained by interaction with humans. So Turkey has a trap, neuter and return policy, which which influences the numbers that, that, that are produced generation on generation. And then in lots of areas, um, there are groups of human individuals who take care of those groups of dogs in terms of feeding them when their normal food sources or their kind of free roaming food sources dry up and um, also make sure that they are dealt with in terms of parasite care and um, well parasite care worms and fleas mainly Um, and turkey has a policy turkey has um, certainly you know a specific animal welfare policy and legislation and everywhere you go you you will see certainly water supplies of water for the streets and and community animals um, that are um, at the roadside or outside shops or restaurants Um, and you see you know you just you'll see dogs wandering in and out of shops and just being allowed to go to sleep curl up and go to sleep in the corner of a shop which is different from how dogs are perceived and and treated in the UK and there's a, there is a degree of um care there in the direction from from the human to the dog in providing shelter food um parasite control as i say it's interesting because that's the same thing that i see in nepal with the dogs right there's a a a very active uh what used to be called street dogs and what we like i like to use the term free living free living dogs because there's not that expectation that dogs need to be in people's houses it's actually still a very new concept that dogs you know, are owned by an individual mm. uh, in Nepal, and it is expanding, but very much that that sort of free living uh, animal. And I think that it's if I if I were a dog, what would I like? Would I like to be you know on the on the street with my friends, um, or would I like to be you know picked up 
taken to a shelter, put in a cage, and then adopted to a single person. Well, the out, outside you know, the end product is wonderful, you know, being with a family, but that in-between product is really, you know, traumatic and scary. And mm. whereas here in the U.S., I feel like we have that that need to, oh my gosh, we can't see a dog on the street. As soon as we see a dog, we need to bring that dog in and, you know, get him to a shelter and get him adopted out. So it's a very different policy. Yes, it is. And even, you know, even the, the living with the family, I mean, that's where I do equine behaviour consultations, but I also do canine behaviour consultations as well in the UK. And in Turkey, when, you know, when I look at the free living dogs on the wherever they are, I just I do not see the, the behaviour problems in Turkey that I get called out for in the UK. And I think people don't understand or appreciate how difficult it is to cope as a dog in um, the UK or a typical kind of UK or a US environment. The, The concept of doors and walls and garden fences and being on a lead are, are things that and not they don't come naturally to dogs dogs have to learn to cope with those and to habituate to them and if they don't habituate to them then sensitization happens and all sorts of fears and anxieties those types of behaviors can occur and that that's where i come in when it's a dog that is just is not coping with the life it's being expected to lead whereas in turkey i see dogs you know they'll they'll hang out in the village square near the tea garden. Um, they one dog might be lying down in a really nice patch of sunlight. Another dog will come up. You won't see any overt communication that you could observe between those two dogs. But either the approaching dog will will walk up and then just walk away again because not your time to have that patch of sunlight or the dog that's lying down might have had their fill of that motivated behavior of lying down and catching rays and getting warm and so that dog might be the one then to get up and move away and you will see the approach the dog that approached settling themselves down and lying down in that exact same spot and there is there, I don't see resource holding contests um, in um, in dogs. I guess because there are sufficient resources, and part but part of that does go back to the fact that they are fed extra food by the the humans in the community um, when required. I was quite surprised at the first trap neuter vaccinate release. Uh, camp that I went to in Nepal in that they go out, collect all the dogs from, from the area, put them all into one truck and take them to the center. And I must have stood there with just an incredulous look on my face because I, how can you take all these dogs and just throw them in into one pickup mm. and they're not going to fight? They don't. They're no. so used to understanding each other that that you can take uh, unrelated dogs from different areas and bring them into a smaller space. And there is no. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it blew my mind. If we tried to do that here, we would have a, a major dog fight. We would. And I think and part of that, I think, is to do with epigenetically the, the breeding that's gone down through so many generations now of the resilient free living dogs where being chucked in the back of a truck is is something that's manageable for them mentally whereas a, you know an exact example behavior cases that I might have in the UK would be a dog that just jumps out of their skin when a leaf blows in the wrong direction or something outside makes the wrong kind of noise they're so sensitized to their environment and what goes on in it and I, I think that's one thing that really came out of our, our paper was this this conclusion that feral is is largely defined as escape from human control, and whether that's sort of our idea of um, 
yeah, for example, what a, a dog is. So a dog running loose in the UK would be termed feral because that's not how dogs are supposed to behave. Um, and yeah, we, we have this idea of how animals should behave, where they should be. And when they kind of defy that, that's, that's when the feral label comes in. And I find mm. it kind of interesting in some of my responses too, there was sort of this element of trying to re-embrace feral as a, as a, a positive thing. And, and also the, the joking too, like saying my neighbor's kids, sort of what does feral mean to you? And they're like, oh, the neighbor's kids or, or, or my kids. And, and it's basically just this idea that, in this case, children that are running free, doing their own thing, making noise, playing in dirt like kids do, that that's deemed by some as feral because they're not being proper and civilized. And that did come up. That was a, a, a definition that came up a lot was this association of feral as being uncivilized. But then this idea of civilized is, is cultural and um, and yeah, it just comes. And, and I love the term community cats. I try and sort of use that rather than feral or street cats because mm -hmm. it implies that they're they're part of the community and 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 I think it sort of fosters this idea like with the community dogs you were talking about that that they're part of the community and and people care for them and they they're they're meant to be there so they're not feral. Right. Yes, they're valued. They they have value um for that community. Yeah. Well and I think it's interesting too um I want to kind of go down the, the horse path for a minute, because when we think about feral cat versus community cat, right? Feral is a, it's a scary term. It's a cat that is out of our control, whereas community cat is, is a welcome cat. And we see this with the cat horse comparison too, because, you know, a feral um, cat is kind of a, a nuisance, whereas a feral horse is a beautiful creature that we um, plan vacations to go visit here in the U.S. and, you know, go see the, the feral horses. But but that's not what the ad says. You know, the ad says, go see the wild horses. Uh, and so mm -hmm. I wanted, I was hoping, Debbie, you could touch, touch on that a little bit about this whole, um, when does being feral become being wild? Or is wild just another term that we use to kind of control that narrative between a, a horse that's under human control and a horse that has gone off on its own? <laughs> Yeah, and I think genetically, um, the, the 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 kind of um, prevailing discourse is that there is there is no horse now that you could describe as wild. All those subspecies have become extinct, and even um, the Zawalski horse, which was thought until quite recently to be the one wild um, subspecies left, is now thought to have had domesticated um, Ferrus equus caballus genes for, for many, many generations. Um, but the, yes, I mean, I was, I was thinking in terms of the, of how wild is used in, um, in the States and in Australia as well, because as well as it being the, the, beautiful symbol of how the West was won. Um, there is also now the encroachment of wild or feral horses, free roaming horses onto areas of land where they are not welcome. And it might be that they're not welcome because there is interspecies competition for resources in terms of the, the human occupiers want to utilize that land and the horses are getting in the way or also I think in terms of um, the Australian situation there is there is a discourse of what are the native species and what aren't the native species and the, the brumbies are deemed to be not a native species because of the way that they arrived in Australia and then became free living because they escaped did they escape domestication or did they escape the the kept mm. captive managed status so they too are um persecuted if, if you want to use that term um and although obviously there are people who think that that pulling the numbers is justified um 
But the fact is that they are not always. So there's a, a kind of a dichotomy there and a tension between how they might be viewed as beautiful wild beasts. And that's usually the the language that's used is if if they're beautiful and awe inspiring, then they are wild. What what does that mean in terms of the meaning that we're making out of that socially and culturally? Or if they are the ones that are not welcome for whatever reason, then the terminology changes to, oh well, they're feral. They they're worthless they don't mean anything they have no value so uh, and and the human um perspective is privileged and so then though those animals are cold or if not cold then relocated rounded up and, and relocated um a lot of them are taken in and, and then trained so they then they do become kept animals what does that mean for their mental and emotional states and health that they were born that their ancestors for so many generations were born free living and now they are taken into a completely different paradigm of control where the control the control is taken away from them choice and agency is taken away from them and the control then lies in the human side of the relationship and i think we have to weigh that use of feral as well because here wild means oh yes they're welcome come in and feral essentially means killable or removable right and i Mm -hmm. think Chris has run into that too with with the cat situation. And we've seen that all seen that with the cat situation in in Australia, that Mm -hmm. if you deem something feral, that means that uh, you are allowed to practice control over that and and it makes them killable. Mm. And the thing is, it really seems to be working on um, cat people too. So um, one, I'm going to read this this quote out from from my data set. and it's part of a conversation about um, conserva- conservationist proposals to to cull feral cats, and um, and it, it really illustrates how this word feral acts as a, a form of othering. So, yeah, um, it reads, "Calm down, folks. There's a big difference between little fluffy you adore and a feral cat population." So, it starts. Feral cats are not pets, they're wild animals. So that is like really full of contradiction. First, they're calling them wild animals, but in the same discourse, wild animals are good, um, whereas feral animals are, are bad. And But the, the real thing that strike, struck me is how, um, yeah, the only thing that, that differentiates Fluffy from, from a feral cat is their circumstances of birth. Um, they're both the same species um, yeah. but calling one feral allows people who are emotionally attached to to their companion cat to say okay that's not like fluffy that's that's a, a horrible feral creature um, and I think that's really the power of, of feral to really other species like cats who are, are loved and yeah this was responding to an article it wasn't just talking about killing um, feral cats was also pigs and I think another species in there that was totally um, ignored by the comments it was all the cats focus was on the cats being culled mm, that's what that's what came home to me when you were reading that was the the, the linguistic power of the, the, the two different words um, and, and what they mean and what they mean ultimately to the the lives or the deaths mm. of of those species. Well, this is probably a good uh, a good place to refer back to your your comments about domestication, Debbie, because we uh, we have written a paper about domestication as well, and we'll put that in the comments section. But it does come down to um, you know the the two different definitions of of domestication and one is you know that actual biological definition of domestication of of having been brought in 
to human control and having humans controlling your breeding and having, you know, human control over your, your whole life, as opposed to what seems to be the more common uh, sort of non-academic definition of domesticated as anything that you've brought into your your home, right? And so people sort of use that word to determine if something is truly feral or something is is not feral. And yeah, it's another problematic element. Mm, yes, it is. Yeah, the the meanings. So you know, again, one word, so many different meanings depending on on context and depending on. And I think that that also brings in an element of when and why certain groups of people choose to use the same word in different with different meanings or or different words, feral versus wild or domesticated, but using that in um, to mean different things in different contexts. Very much so. Let's, uh, let's follow through that domestication thought process to the elephants that I work with in Nepal, because elephants have clearly not been domesticated. They don't meet the uh, requirements for biological domestication, right? Humans have never had uh, control over their their breeding. Um, They're a large charismatic animal that that takes a long time to reproduce, which means that they don't really have those uh, pre-domestication, pre-adaptation characteristics that, that Price talks about. Uh, And yet, if you look at a lot of documentation, um, authorities will refer to them as domesticated elephants. And a lot of countries have domesticated elephant management policies. Uh, And I think that that's another way to use this, this language as control, because once something is called domesticated for long enough, it, it has that implication of, of us being able to treat it however we want. But when an elephant escapes human control, we don't use the word feral. We use the word rogue. Yes. Which has the same connotations, maybe escaped human control, not not behaving as they should. Right. And so that's, and the, com- again, that's the commonality, isn't it? That the, you know, they're controlled or they're not controlled. And Controlled is good, out of control, out of human control and the the preferential status of the human, out of that control, feral, not good, not wanted, not helpful, not useful to us. Yes. And I find it interesting, too, just because rogue, when you think of that word, you think about like the lovable rogue, like, I don't know, Jack Sparrow from the, (laughs) you know, and then we have the actual rogue, which indicates, you know, Um, out of societal control as well, you know, acting against um, societal norms and creating discussion or uh, destruction and breaking the law. And, you know, so it's, again, it's all these, these labels um, when in reality, the elephant is simply returning to the wild, you know, we've taken away its ability to survive well in the wild because, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, elephants eat a hundred different plants in the wild and in captivity, they may have you know, 10. So when they do return into the wild, as it were, <laughs> you know, they aren't clear. They haven't had that social learning of, of what to eat. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's, you know, a lot of that responsible for the elephants going rogue is that they just don't, they don't have the um, ability to deal with the situation. Like you were saying yeah. with, with dogs that have lived with humans too long, they no longer have that capacity to sort of deal with, with the stress and end up just sort of running around looking for help you know Mm. it's interesting that idea of lovable rogue because some people see feral cats or free living cats in that way and sort of feral to them they're like oh I I love I love feral cats or I love seeing the cats in the neighborhood They're, they're my friends and they're um and almost this kind of affinity so so that they feel sort of connected to these cats that are living um living independently and and yeah um but then on the other side of that it is is this idea of feral as it being um in need so the idea that feral cats in particular need rescuing 
um, and that a, a cat that's out on the streets is inherently unloved and, and needs loving and needs to be bought in and um, kept by the fireplace. Um, and for many cats, that's not what they want, especially if they've never really had much contact with humans. That's the yeah. taking them into a, an animal shelter is like, as, as you mentioned, Debbie, with the dogs would be horrendous for them to be sort of forced into that human environment. Um, but yeah, the, this this feral label also. Um, yeah, it, it's connected with these ideas of stray and abandoned, which is totally different. A cat that's been abandoned, that's always lived in a house and suddenly thrown out on the streets. Yeah, they're, they're, they, they need help there. Um, but yeah, it's this, this, this feral label is taken and, and used in so many different ways. And usually it is negative. It's, um, and especially regarding conservationist um, jargon, it, it can be a, um, yeah, a definition that allows them to be cold. Yes, and what you were saying there, Chris, was just about um, it, it brought to mind to me this idea of them just, you know, not being able to look after themselves when actually the free living feral ones can look after themselves and have looked after themselves and there's no cognizance given to that no recognition or differentiation between the ones that have been abandoned and do need support um, doesn't necessarily mean that they need taking into another household although you know perhaps they do if that's where they've come from um, but the ones who are agentically making decisions about their own survival making choices about how they live their life and, and living a very um a, a very fruitful life from the perspective of that species but that's not the same as the perspective of the human I think that that's where a lot of the um the the tensions lie yeah. so, so it's also control too I mean even control by love you you want to yes. to protect them and look after them because you you see them as as needing needing help so it's another form of of human human control that's yeah. well intended maybe in, in the case of free living cats um but not necessarily <laughs> not everything needs to be controlled by humans and i think that's yeah. a term stray versus feral too feral represents yeah. in to us something that has escaped and deserves to be out there whereas stray mm -hmm. indicates something that has wandered away accidentally and is in need of our help <laughs> i i wonder too if it has anything to do with what these animals eat that relates to their acceptability as feral versus wild. Because if you have wild horses that wander onto your property and you're sitting out there in awe of these wild horses who might be eating grass, it's a little different than when you've got cats bringing dead birds onto your patio and you, you, you are accusing the cats of killing off, you know, native species, mm -hmm. um, which, they occasionally do right uh so 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 do you think that has anything to do with it that we accept this herbivorous um non-threatening creature more than we we do this uh carnivorous creature yeah it is interesting i mean a horse i suppose you know your lawn would quickly disappear as mm -hmm. well if if um a, a free living horse decided to pitch up and, and eat your grass um so but I definitely do think that there is some, it's almost a kind of interspecies resource holding tension there. Um, so, yeah, if you think of, uh, I mean, I'm thinking of also, you know, dogs who raid dustbins, free living dogs who might raid a dustbin or, a, a, you know, annoy the tourists by sitting begging at tables. Uh, there is definitely, I think, something in the different, food that they eat and also the different ways that they have learned either they've learned it um they've learned a behavior that enables them to acquire food or they have a natural a naturally occurring behavior that enables them to acquire food and when that comes into conflict with how humans would want to um um control their environment, I suppose, in terms of manicure their gardens or other ways that animals might encroach in um, a food gathering kind of way that, again, another 
another source of conflict and tension. Yeah. And I wondered about that because here in Florida, we've got the rhesus macaque monkeys that are referred to as as free ranging um, rather than feral. When they they do obviously uh, if they're kept in um, you know laboratory settings, definitely rhesus macaques can qualify as a domesticated species. And here in Florida, what happened is that some of the uh, little tour boat captains decided that purchasing macaques and letting them go on islands would be a fun way to have tourists interact with the wild uh, by throwing them them fruit. You know, they're they're also um, right. plant eaters. And uh, what happened instead is that um, the monkeys would come and, and jump on the boats and steal people's belongings, looking for this food that they'd been promised. Um, so what happened is a lot of them were relocated to islands where they would be safe. Uh, no one bothered to do the research that they can swim. Uh, and they swam off the island and expanded through Florida. Uh, and I wonder if part of the, the reason that they were allowed to expand for so long was just that they are, you know, plant eaters. They weren't uh, breaking onto people's property and, and, and killing their livestock. Um, but it is interesting to me that these are never, you never see write-ups about feral monkeys in Florida. You just read about free ranging or wild. They call them wild monkeys uh, introduced, you know, this, there's never this, this feral conversation mm -hmm. because I think they were seen as sort of mutually beneficial in the beginning that, you know, they would provide interest for tourists and bring more tourists and they didn't, you know, destroy the native wildlife because people think of native, you know, native wildlife as, as animals, not, not plants. Um, so yeah, I just thought yeah. that. So some sort of um, some sort of symbiosis there, and um, the the different way of describing them because of the lack of conflict with the human community. Yeah, so they were left alone just for for years here in Florida, and they expanded, which was great. And um, they hadn't been any coals uh, for for years, and then all of a sudden they started to. Um, carry a virus that's contagious to humans. Mm -hmm. um, and so now suddenly, you know, this, this conversation has restarted um, so that the occasional damage to humans through bites or, you know, theft um, was a kind of overlooked. It was accepted, but now that, that they pose a threat um, to people in the U S now there's this um, different discussion, you know, the, yeah. the conversation has, has changed from their uh, in a cute little free ranging, you know, introduced species to now being a problem, you know, a pest species. Hmm. That, I mean, that, that's that's interesting in, in terms of the UK at the moment. We've got avian flu, and I'm not sure. I mean, certainly the um, the, the egg laying chickens are all by law at the moment required to be housed inside to try to prevent the spread of that but um not totally sure about my grounds in stating this but there, i know there are, there are some conversations about what might what might that mean if that spreads to the wild bird population there we go again they're described as wild um and then what that might mean in terms of um, and any change in the way that they are viewed and, and actually thinking further about that certainly in the UK we have um, bird species such as pigeons that, that are commonly referred to as pests so yeah there is there's that aspect as well. Which is interesting because uh, pigeons were one of the earliest domesticated species yeah. so we've got this this longer term relationship with the species and now that has completely flipped on its head and become that they're you know a pest species so mm. but, so yeah they stopped being useful to us and now we might perceive them as actually harmful and I wonder too if it would be a difference because you know, from, from an American, uh, you know, like you said, how the West was one mentality. I think that that ferality has a positive feeling. Look, oh, this is a feral animal that we're going to support because it's, you know, it's tough and it survived on its own. I wondered if we started applying feral to pigeons. Would would there be this this change of perspective? You know, would, would people start 
talking about those feral pigeons that have made a life for themselves. They're so brave. And, and <laughs> yeah. Yes, we kind of, um, you know, to, um, from a species perspective, dependent on humans in terms of domestic initial domestication. But like you say, now they're kind of broken free, broken free of that domestication um, chain or fence or boundary and and live their lives differently. And what does that mean to us? And, it, and what indeed does it mean to them? And why is it we're not concerned with protecting, you know, these populations as opposed to protecting, you know, free living dogs or, mm. you know. Yeah, going back to, to the power of feral. Um, so one thing I've um, written about is um, the idea of a, a moral panic over roaming cats um, and other other animals that have been subject to, to moral panics also include um, free roaming dogs. Um, mm -hmm. Often, when yeah, somebody has been been attacked or bitten by a dog, and then uh, so basically, a, a moral panic is something that um, it's something that's real and something that may well be a real concern, but it's sort of blown out of proportion by the media, and the, this kind of folk devil is created. And and for cats, feral really acts as othering, um, as as I already mentioned. So you've got this feral who's different from domesticated cats. So you can have the same discourse and um and I I, I call it the the feral, the feral folk devil, um, in the case of cats. And and similar there's um I, I can put the reference in the the thing, but there's a couple of examples with dogs where the dogs have been portrayed as a folk devil, the pers the the individual that's to be feared, the the wild the the feral dogs that are going around biting people and and endangering lives, and um, have been behind a couple of um, um, yeah coals. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Now, oh yeah, so the other, <laughs> but the other. Um, framing of the folk devil is it's the human's fault. So the the humans are blamed for allowing their dogs to escape and run wild. So the, the folk devil then becomes irresponsible owners. Um, and, and I see that too with cats as either the cats themselves being um, framed as as the, the, the bird killing folk devils. Um, and then there's the irresponsible owners who... <laughs> let the cats poop on people's lawns. Um, so I kind of... Of course, they've got any control over that whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> so it all goes down to sort of, yeah, this idea of control and and anything that is out of, yeah, what mm. is proper is... Well, I think that's why these discussions of, of language are so interesting because, you know, you don't, you don't speak language to yourself in... in uh, solitude, right? It requires a, a participation. It requires a listener and a user of the language. And so by nature, that makes it sort of flexible and changeable. And it also, you know, so reliant on the environment in which you, you find yourself. You know, if I'm standing on the street and cats are crowding around me and scratching my feet, clearly I'm going to use the term differently than I would if I have this cute little kitten in my backyard who you know, I, it's so it's, it's it's very dependent upon the the listener. It's dependent upon the user of the word, and it's very dependent upon the situation. So there's there's really no way to um, to, to change what these terms mean uh, unless we start using them in in different ways. You know, as as researchers, as scientists, you know, start applying them in in more specific ways um, to to stop their misuse. Yes, and I, you know, I I wonder if we can ever do that, especially in the age of the internet, where there are so many more papers published and so many more groups of people referring to um, scientific publications, but referring to them in a kind of popular way, in terms of you know holding up one paper and going, hey, you know somebody's written this and it must be true and it proves my point. Instead of understanding how you know a body of knowledge is is built up over over 
time and, and quantity of, of research and publications. Um, so I almost certainly behaviorally, I, I, I see that as, as a kind of Pandora's box where previously we, as scientists, we were able to keep a tighter hold on some of these definitions, but that now they're just they're out there in the land of social media being made meaning of and um, altered sometimes inside you know with our awareness sometimes outside our awareness and and what that will mean um going forward for for society in, in terms of those definitions and that language i think one positive example comes from um sort of feminist scholars in in the 60s with this big push away from using he as a generic so rather than mankind or gone where no man has gone before it sort of changed to human humankind Mm -hmm. um and replacing the generic he with either he she or there to um and yeah that's sort of been a big change and I was reading it was a paper done in Australia where they they looked at um keynote speakers and how they were using this language now and whether they were using male specific um specific or sort of the um yeah the, the more um politically correct progressive language and it sort of shifted I think and yeah they also looked at rate people guests on radio shows um and like the shift from recordings in the 50s to the I think it was early 2000s the study was published and sort of there's a shift from almost entirely being um the the patriarch the language of the patriarchy to like 90 plus percent using um person instead of man and um saying she or they rather than just he for a generic um yeah for a, for a generic person and and yeah and yeah interestingly the, the, there was like the five ten percent they were all sort of senior male <laughs> academics <laughs> still using sure. um, yeah. So yeah and I think that's just sort of common language now I I think that um and that's a positive thing because it's it, it's very subconscious but yeah so the idea that you can have a a police yeah it's not a police man it's not a, a man a, a male job and yeah I, I think um yeah there, there's real potential for sort of changing cultural perceptions through language though with the the internet and social media now it's um a whole other ball game right <laughs> Yeah, that is that's so interesting, and it, it it makes me think of um, the thing that I mentioned at the start, which was about this this concept of the kept animal. As soon as I read that, being the age I am, I went straight back to the concept of a kept woman. Yes. Um, and uh, again, the you know the idea that this this person couldn't think for themselves, needed a degree of protection and control. So it's going to be it's interesting to me to see uh, to look at how this term kept, um, as in a, a kept animal, it's does the same do the same kind of meanings attract to that in terms of the animal are we talking about animals who need protection and control possibly perceptually socio-culturally at the moment we are but how might that change and um why has that word been introduced alongside terms like pet domesticated companion farm Feral. Well, I think it's because captive is, has so many connotations as well. And, and I use the, when I refer in my papers, I use the term captive elephant as opposed to, uh, de- well, depending on the situation, sometimes I use working elephant um, just because I don't think that, you know, domestication doesn't fit. Um, it is a wild animal who has been brought into human control. Uh, and that's why I, I do use the term captive. You know, it's a very telling word. Um, but I think that if we start thinking of our own companion animals as captive animals, because there are a lot of them that would prefer not to be living in homes, right? And I think that that's a term that's fraught with guilt you know, for, for their human captors as it were. And so I wonder if that isn't why this kept 
seems to be a sort of a kinder, gentler word that it, it indicates you're giving something back as well, that it's a mutual relationship. And so I wonder as we progress in realizing the the needs and desires and, and agency of our companion animals, will we find you know new terms that better describe an equal relationship? Because kept is still not equal. We really need to find mm-hmm. that kind of equal word that, that indicates that yes. they're family members, they're kin instead of simply kept. Yes. And then when when if that arises, how will that affect how we I'm going to I'm going to use the word keep them in terms of what do we allow them to what do we try and stop them doing prevent them from doing what do we allow them to do what control do we exert over them and going back to the kind of rejection of the term captive I find that really interesting because yes we we don't like to use that word but in my behavior work with dogs and horses the, the thing that helps them the most is enabling them to express their species specific qualities and behaviors that the very behaviors that are innate to their telos their speciesness of the horseness of a horse the dogness of a dog which all goes back to pre-domestication at what, whatever the level of, of captiveness or, or uh, um, of how we keep them now, that's what it goes back to. So in a way, going feral is a positive thing, right? If yeah, going going feral, it's returning to that 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 state, and um, yeah, maybe I was also thinking with the language thing too. So the suffer, suffer, suffragettes, you you could almost say that they were feral women, right? They they escaped yes. the patriarchy and they reclaimed their um yeah place in society yes. so yeah mm-hmm. we kind of feral is used a lot to um kind of degrade and other well humans and other animals but yeah maybe we should reframe it as a positive thing <laughs> so we're seeing about- a real sort of fe- feminist intersection and, and um you know pers- perspective there aren't we um emerging very much that reclamation of agency yeah yeah, I think that's very important. Yes, I think so. All right. Well, that sounds like an excellent place to end our conversation today. And uh, we look forward to talking with you again on the Anthrozoology podcast. Thanks for listening. Oh.